Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 1. We'll go as far as we can. I had 11 pages of notes, and I whittled it down to 10. Oh, you're welcome. Anything I can do to, to speed things along. Okay, we're going to talk about Jesus sending out the 72 people. I'm going to uh, read, start reading and stop when I get tired. Uh, okay, uh, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him into every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. Doesn't sound very friendly, does it? Okay. We know that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, right? Excuse me. <clears throat> and he plans uh, to preach and teach the kingdom along the way. So he sends out these 72 front men to uh, prepare the way for him. Uh, and to the places he intended uh, to visit. So he sends them out in pairs. That's 36 stops. Some manuscripts say 70. Let's take care of that right now. So here we have an errancy in the Bible uh, they want to claim. How important is it that they sent 70 or 72? That make a difference in your salvation one way or the other, wherever way you believe. So there are several uh, theories that I won't go into why there's a difference there. Because I have a theory. My theory is they sent out 70, the 72 came back. And we'll cover that just a little bit later. I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so if, uh, if that's not important, what is the important message in the verse? The, the what? Well, I was in... Well, let, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, the important message in the verse, the job of ministry is not confined to the 12. He's raised 12. He's raised 12. Now he's sent out 72 or 70. Here are 72 others who are just as capable as the 12. What could this mean? When 72 are just as capable. He picked 72 of the people that's been following him around. Uh, we see that the abilities of the 72 were on par with the abilities of the 12. They had the power to heal the sick and cast out demons. If you'll look at verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So they're doing well. Um, uh, did they always possess this power? Were they born with it? Where did they get this power to cast out demons? Exactly, from, from Jesus. Uh, his authority and power he uh, made them caretakers of, and they went out and used it like they were supposed to. Uh, from the same place the 12 got theirs was Jesus. So 
how could we classify these men in, uh, before they voiced their willingness to serve? How could we classify these people before they went out, before Jesus picked? Okay, you, 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 you in there, and, and those 10 over there, you guys in the group, come here, come here. I'm going to send you out two by two. Before he did that, what kind of people were they? What? Ordinary. You looking at my notes? Look at my notes. Ordinary people. Just ordinary people. Now, uh, was this appointment to evangelism just for the 12 or the 72? Was this an appointment to evangelism just for the 12 and the 72? And of course, that's no. How do we know this? Well, what's the first thing he asked them to do? What was it? After the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out, two by two ahead of him for every town and place. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out more workers into, this, into his field of harvest. So he sent these 72 people out. What was the first thing he asked them to do? Pray for more people. Pray for more workers in the harvest field. That's what he asked me. The first thing he asked him. Pray for more people in the harvest field. And so if 71 out, let's just say 71 out and 72 come back, somebody got a prayer answer, didn't they? <laughs> you know, somebody said, listen to two, the, two of the ones that came through his town. And he said, hey, hey I'm going to go with you. Or maybe two of them said at the same time or, you know, one one place, one the other. But that's my theory on the difference between 70 and 72 people uh, uh, that he sent out, and that doesn't mean a thing in the world to anybody but me. Um, the fact that we are reading this, and that it, this will blow your mind, and that has not uh, been hidden from us. If you believe prayer is a powerful thing, then these prayers of the 72 have found answer in people down through history, just like us, ordinary people. So God is still answering the prayers of the 72 people, or the 70 people, isn't he? Down through time. He calls people, and he's called people out of this church. Uh, one. the command of Jesus to pray for workers does not end with the 72 but continues as long as there is a harvest field so we as workers who have answered the call to service are to continue to pray for more workers in the harvest field also the fact that Jesus asked them to pray in that particular way, might suggest that God might have overcome the re reluctance and apathy of those he wishes to send. So, what he's saying here, what I think he's saying when I wrote this, was that one of the biggest inhibitors of having enough workers in the harvest field is reluctance is apathy right well I would go but you know I just bought a house and I've got to mow the grass or whatever um This also indicates that God uh, does use our prayers to accomplish his purposes and evangelize the world, just like the urgency Jesus felt because 
his time on earth was running out, we too have the same urgency because the time left for all ministry is running out. Time is short. We must work while it's still day, for night is coming. <coughs> Excuse me. When no man can work. Uh, verse 3, lambs among the wolves. Now, you, you know the reason I, I picked this passage was he said some things in here that I didn't know what he meant, and this was one of them. Um, Go, I am sending you out like lambs among the wolves. What do you suppose that means? Wolves um, are really kind of a symbol for danger, right? And the lambs are really kind of a symbol for being uh, vulnerable. vulnerable, exactly, being uh, uh, defenseless. defenseless. So he's sending them out among that. And uh, do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone along the way. Let's get rid of the sandals first. He's not telling them to go barefoot, <laughs> okay? Uh, although some of them may not have sandals and went barefooted. I don't know. But what he's talking about here is extra sandals. Okay? So, um, all this stuff slows you down. Uh, I remember, I'm going to give you examples uh, for these things, and most of them are going to be from my time that I spent uh, on the mission field, uh, a week at a time, sometimes two weeks a year, for the last 30 years. When we first started going, I'm trying to think of everything I might need to take. And so I, I packed a, a tool bag, and I said no, and then I packed a tool box. And then I built a tool box, because I didn't have one big enough, and I, I put everything in it. And uh, Jimmy Mitten, who was a veteran, looked at it and he said, man, that's nice, but we can't take that. <laughs> we don't have room for that. Uh, so you have, uh, how about going on vacation? Go on vacation. We went on vacation for a week, just got back. Donna and I, in that SUV, and then behind us, everything, you know, folded down open. We filled it up. And uh, I thought I was packing light. I didn't use half the stuff I put in the suitcase. But uh, that's what he's talking about. Don't let stuff that you have slow you down from the ministry that God has called you to do. Um, do not take, don't take the sandals. Don't greet anyone. How about don't greet anyone? Uh, have you ever been in a work situation where you you have to get a job done, and you're working, and somebody comes up and taps you on the shoulder, and they want to talk, and you're going to be friendly, and you're going to be courteous, and you're going to talk to them but you just lost 15 or 20 minutes. And the next thing you know, you know, uh, stuff happens and you lose more time and then you don't get done what you want to get done. Jewish greetings were very elaborate. It was a big deal and they lasted a long time. So what he's saying is, you got something you need to do that's more important then custom is more important than what you've been taught to do. You've got to set your priorities. Okay. Now, the, the, the wolves and the lambs, are we in danger when we share the gospel? Really? What kind of danger?
okay, we have an answer here. We have to make ourselves vulnerable to the people who, uh, who have not accepted Christ. That's your answer. And that's true. That's true. Um, we, we face dangers here that people would laugh at in other countries as far as being classified as dangerous. Like uh, uh, prejudice at work or maybe even losing a job. Uh, because we are Christian and we, we profess Christianity out loud to anybody who will listen, at least we should. Um, but other people in other parts of the world, and this Bible is not just written to the United States of America, believe me, are still dying because of, they profess Christ. So there will be dangers. Um, there have been several years for the Mexico trips when we went uh, to minister in, uh, in Mexico where we would go to some places where Uh, they were a little dicey, like Juarez. I know you heard Juarez on the radio, or on the news back in the day. War is this and war is that, and these people hanging from bridges and Juarez. And some people dropped their uh, application and said, no, we're not going, it's too dangerous. Yeah, it, it just said that. Did they not read that? It's going to be dangerous. We have to count the cost of following Christ. I just told him, I said, look, I live next to Memphis, Tennessee. You know, Juarez may be a, 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 may be a restful place compared to Memphis. And, you know, you have to cross that bridge every once in a while. The thing is, something bad can happen to you any place that you are. Some fool can pull out in front of you on the interstate. Uh, if you got a newer vehicle like Sam there, somebody might decide they like it better than he does and, and, uh, and jack the thing. You know, there's all kinds of things that can happen that's in life, danger. It, it's, you know, you pay your nickel and you take your chances. Might as well do it serving Jesus right might as well make it count okay we talked about the purse and the sandals yeah yep yeah. shoot the world can be a hostile place period and we don't take lightly the possibility of bodily harm when we leave on those vans. But danger gave the 72 no excuse for withdrawing from their mission and shouldn't be an excuse today. That, however, has not proven to be the case. Because, see, we live in a bubble here where everything is safe and nice and cushy to the touch. But... And then we talk about going out someplace where there might be some danger. We're, we're like, oh, I can't do that. It's dangerous out there. Well, 30 years later, I'm still breathing. I don't remember losing anybody on a trip. Okay. The terms lamb suggests uh, the disciples will be defenseless against enemies. This is just a reciprocal of the first statement. Like Jesus himself, they are to prepare no defenses against their enemies, nor are they to minister in their own strength. Depend solely on God, taking no provision, 
no money, no sandals, extra sandals. It's funny how we try to prepare uh, for those uh, mission trips. We rack our brains trying to think of everything we need, but God always seems to arrange a circumstance where we are totally unprepared. Then it's time to stand still and watch the deliverance of the Lord. Everything we can take in three, 4,000 pounds of equipment, and then we get to a place and need something. I mean, it, we had one table saw, it quit. I had to go to the border to get another one. Luckily, we were working close to the border. Can I tell you without telling you the whole story that God was in that and he cared which, he cared which table saw I got? It's like I kept saying, no, not that one, this one. I said, no, I want this one. No, not that one, this one. And, well, it was a better saw. It cost us, end up paying less money for it. And uh, then there was Donna, Texas. Now, Donna, Texas, I thought it's kind of a fun name because uh, Donna... My wife, it's the only trip she ever went with me on to Donna, Texas. Donna, Texas was like going to Mexico because it was on the border. All the signs on all the businesses were in Spanish, and no one spoke any English, but everybody was an American. You know, that these places exist. We had the uh, trailer loaded for the Pew crew, and uh, the crew started becoming ill and having other things they had to do, and next thing you know, it was just me and one other guy, Dan Madison, the trailer full of equipment, and uh, the leader said, bring it, let's see what God can do. So while we were in Don, Texas, building this steel building, they had a, an inspector from the uh, city that came by and shut the job down because he was Catholic. And he says, you gotta have a chain link fence up around that job site. And uh, so he shut us down. So guess what? His boss had a secretary and the secretary was assembly of God. And she talked his boss into opening the job back up, and he did. He shut us down, what was it, three times? Three times he shut us down. And all three times we were open back up the same day. So, you know, it doesn't matter what you're prepared for. Uh, God's got your back. Don't stop to greet anyone along the way. Ministry must be a priority. They are to allow nothing to slow them down. In Jewish culture, greeting was long and elaborate. Jesus did not necessarily want them to be rude, but he doesn't want them to take too much time away from the important ministry. The ministry that God has given you is very important to him, or he wouldn't have given it to you. The thing that hinders us and keeps us from ministry may seem important. They might be good things, not necessarily bad, but your ministry is priority number one. Same time your uh, spouse, sometime your spouse may not understand that. They may interpret this as you don't love me anymore when it's not true. Or... That's more, you think that's more important than I am, which is also not exactly true, but closer to the truth in the first statement. Usually it means spousal time is being sacrificed for other time that is your time and not necessarily ministry time. Guilty. You can't, if other people are involved in your life, you have to make considerations. I think balance is a good word to use in those situations. Verse 5 through 7. When you enter 
a house. First say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in the house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Okay. As they entered the house, they were to offer a blessing. In English, it would be something like peace to this house. Much more than a custom or a politeness, it was a blessing of God, literal peace. It literally means that God's presence would enter or leave the house depending on the host, whether they're worthy or unworthy. You think that's still probably a good thing? You know, the other day, I was at Walmart, and they had changed their screen on the Help Yourself Checkout deal, and I was struggling with it. And there was this young girl that come up behind me, and I could feel her eyes boring into me as I tried to scan items and make the stupid machine work. And finally she said, do you need some help? And I said, yes, ma'am, I surely do. And she helped me, and then she never got, man, you know what I said? I said, blessings unto you. Now what I say? I say, may, may, may God bless you and keep you. I didn't want to go into the may, make his faith to shine upon you and all that, but I said, I just pronounced a blessing on her. I think we can do that. I think we should do that. She probably thought I was a nut. But she got a blessing. I don't know what it is, but it's there. Okay, um, if the host was found worthy, the presence of God would actually rest on him. Whether ministering in another country or next door, I don't believe it's our place, out of place, if we politely ask if we can pray for our host. If they accept it in the spirit in which it was offered, your blessing will remain with them. If not, it will depart with you. I like what Pastor talks about. Uh, and I'm, I keep saying I'm going to start doing that, but I keep forgetting. When we're eating out, I'm going to ask the server, is there something we can pray about when we pray over this meal for you? I think that's a good habit to get into. I want to see how that works. Um, eat and drink what you're given. What this means for them was to not see themselves as a burden to their host. I didn't know that. To not see themselves as a burden to their host. A workman is worthy of their wages. The, the ministry done in that house while you're staying there, healing and sharing the gospel warrants the payment of food and lodging. Uh, we don't do that much anymore. But I remember a time when an evangel would come through, they would stay at somebody's house. Now, I think staying in a motel is, is better for the evangelist because it gives them uh, time to prepare, you know, to pray and prepare their message. And, and when you talk to them, they say that's what they do for, but this was written in a different time. And there's, a, there's times when, using the term loosely evangelist, sometimes you may get an opportunity to do that. I know one, one summer I stopped to buy a watermelon from a guy on the side of the road, and he said, it's hot, ain't it? And I said, yes, sir, it is. And he said, not hot as hell it's going to be. You, are you saved? And he started preaching to me. Well, he was back the next year, and he brought his son with him, and 
they had a just they were sleeping in a camper shell and the mosquitoes were just wearing them out and i said you guys come home with me and uh, we put him and his son up for two three months donna was pregnant with Mar with mary beth i guess and their neighbors were all mad as they thought these guys are going to kill you in your sleep and rob everything we have and uh, they, they, they didn't use the shower as much as, you know, you'd like them to. But uh, we had all the fruit we could eat, all the watermelon. And he was writing a book. I have a copy of it somewhere on the uh, evil of the Masonic Lodge. And I don't know if he had any luck with it or not. But uh, anyway, I think that's uh, one example of that. Uh, the ministry done in that house uh, is uh, worthy of uh, payment of food and lodging. Uh, I used to feel guilty about eating the food at the fiestas given to us at the end of the trip. I knew the meat and specialty foods that was prepared was far above the normal food budget and quality that they normally ate. I've been in the grocery stores in little towns in Mexico because I was going to buy the family where they let us maybe set up our operation in their yard. I'm going to buy them some food and it was shelf after shelf of beans and rice, beans and rice, beans and rice. That's what they ate, beans and rice. So we bought them some beans and rice, you know. Okay. Yeah, I made it. But we forget that uh, it all belongs to God. It was, in a way, a treat for all of us, hosts and uh, guests alike. Also, what was meant by that statement was that the food might not meet the requirements of the Old Testament food laws, but they were to be thankful about whatever they uh, was put before them. So even if it wasn't kosher, they couldn't curl their lip up and say, I'm not going to eat that. <clears throat> Very few of you out there know who I'm talking about when I say Phil Barber. He was a preacher uh, that was here, and I took him on a Mexico mission trip, and I believe that's when he got the bug to be a missionary. Well, he eventually left the church, went to language school, became a missionary for 20 years in Ecuador, built churches, wrote a Bible school curriculum, was a pastor, co-pastor of one church. And he's retired from that now, and he's preaching in Missouri. Where was I going with that? Um, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was so touchy, so easily to have an upset stomach that, you know, he'd say, we'd be in a, in a place in Mexico, and he'd say, I can't eat that. He said, don't eat that, Chuck. And I said, can I have yours? Because I was hungry. And he said, yeah, but don't eat that. I can't eat that. And uh, uh, one day we were sitting out at lunchtime. Our crew had already fed us. We'd had hamburgers. You know, we got hamburgers and beans a lot. The ladies of the church came out with a big pot of chicken soup. Wanted everybody to eat chicken soup. Well, I was full. I'd had two hamburgers, but I ate a little chicken soup, and they brought me, I don't know, something about my appearance uh, it's happened several times. They brought me a bowl with a chicken leg. <laughs> Took it up like that. Said, oh, el pastore, pastore. And I said, no, no, I'm not the pastor. He's the pastor. <laughs> Point to Phil, and Phil goes, I can't eat that. And I said, eat what's set before you, brother. For I ever needed. I said, get all, suck all the meat off that foot.
I have eaten things I could only guess at. Some good, some, well, we can still make me shudder now and then when I think of them. <laughs> the message, the message of the 72, just like the ministry of Jesus, the healing spoke of the presence of the kingdom. The content of the message was specific. The kingdom of God is near you. Indicates God's rule is present. The kingdom of God has become a reality through the ministry of Jesus and his disciples. Even though the fullness of the kingdom of God is a future event, when the second coming happens, it has broken into this present world through the power of the gospel of Christ. We are present in the same age. We are presently in the same age waiting on the coming of the kingdom. But we can do for the unchurched today what the 72 did for the people that day. We can give them a glimpse of the kingdom to come. If we break through into the world through the sharing of the gospel by us, uh, I think great things can be done for the church. Dust off your feet. When you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is, okay. Uh, but when you enter a town and are not welcome, even the dust of your town that sticks to the feet will be wiped off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for, the, for this town. Oh, I'm doing good. Woe to you, Chorazan. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in your in in you had been performed you know the type on this bible has gotten smaller over the years and i'm just going to have to get another one uh didn't have a shrinkage clause in that uh, had been performed in Ty uh, tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and ashes but it will be more bearable for tyre and Sidon at the judgment then for you and you Capernaum will you be lifted up to the skies no you will go down to the depths he who listens to your listenings to me he who rejects you rejects me but he who rejects me rejects him who sent me that's a mouthful what I get from that, see if you think this is right, is there are different levels of judgment coming. Does that make sense? Some people will be judged. Some sins will be judged harsher than other sins, which <laughs> leads you to think about the other religions talk about the different levels of hell I don't know but that's what I got I got through that the 72 returned with joy and said Lord even the demons submit to us in your name he replied I saw Satan falling like lightning from the heavens I have given you authority to trample on the snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Okay. Here we go with the snakes and the scorpions. Um, Jesus 
is through with the instruction to the 72. He continues on the subject. He said the day of the king. Oh, well, I already covered that. I'm sorry. There. I'm going to skip over Capernaum and Bethsaida. We kind of talked about that. Um, what does it mean to us to have the authority of God? Uh, so, see, because in, no, in other words, God gives uh, Jesus his authority. Jesus gives that authority to the disciples i.e. to us. What does it mean for us to have the authority of God to do what exactly? The authority to preach, the authority to lay hands on the sick and they will be healed, the authority over the power and principalities of this world. We don't know how long the 72 are gone. But when they returned, they seemed surprised that the mojo that Jesus sent them out with actually worked. That's me. I know I believe uh, what the Word says, but I'm still a little surprised when I see it work. I was in Ecuador at Phil's church. And a big draw to the church is when Americans come. So there was a ton there in the service, and when he got through preaching, they all come up to be prayed for. And we're sitting on the front row, and the pastor's looking at me, and he said, come and pray for these people. I said, I don't speak Spanish. I don't know what they're saying. He says, just pray for them. And he was getting all of us to come up and pray for them. And I'm in the middle of this crowd, you know. Can I tell you, I'm not a crowd person. I don't like crowds and everybody's up against you you know and yeah I mean some of you know I'm not much of a hugger either but uh, so this lady came up to me and she's telling me something in Spanish and I I just put my hand on her head and, and prayed for her and said you know God bless her and give her and take care of her needs or what well, I can't remember what I said and she went down under the power of the Holy Spirit on the floor and I looked at my hand. I said, that's never happened before. And so I prayed for another one. And uh, another one was slain in his spirit. And I had four or five of slain in the spirit. And that was the Sunday morning service. And I'm walking around thinking, maybe I'll get a glove for this hand. You know? And so... Uh, I'm thinking, this is, this is a new area open to me. I may have to quit the post office and take it on the road, you know. So I get back to church at service that night, and I'm praying for people, and nobody having an effect on anybody. And so what is God telling me there? <laughs> Ain't that hand. It's the power of God, and, and somebody... Anybody, a normal, ordinary person like me, to be willing to pray. Phil could have said, come up and pray, and I could have, you know, he couldn't have done a thing about it because there was 100 people between us. But I was obedient. The only thing that I did was I was obedient. And... Uh, It's like uh, jumping out of an airplane the first time, or the second time for that matter. You've seen those parachutes work. You get the one just like the ones you saw work fine. You see the tag, it says it's been packed by a certified packer and it's ready to go. You may have even seen the packer pack it, but you're still pleasantly surprised when the thing opens. I know I was. I was thank you, Jesus, all the way to the ground. <laughs> you know what? That fool taught me into going up again. He said it's better the second time. He lied. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, let me finish up this scripture reading. What was that? Well, I don't think I did. No, it's on 20. Um, okay, so commentary. So, when God asks you to do something that you think is, that's, that's not me, that's not in my purview, go ahead and, and do what the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do. Um, the point is, it's okay to be surprised when the sick get well as long as you believe enough to pray for them to get well in the first place. Now, they were happily surprised specifically about what part of the ministry, the casting out of demons. They thought that was cool. Well, yeah, the people got healed, but we can cast out demons. But apparently, uh, they believed enough in that uh, Uh, they believed enough in that uh, that they went ahead and tried it anyway. Jesus uh, tell them why he personally saw Satan fall from heaven and, de and, and was defeated. He doesn't say exactly when. Now, this is stuff I don't like to get into. There are three theories. And, you know, if you just really want to know when that happened, why it is important, I don't personally think it is. Uh, but the, uh, the first um, theory is a pre-existent Christ witness Satan fall based on Isaiah 14, 12. And that takes the fall of the king of Babylon. is pictured with the fall of Lucifer. And in commentary for this passage, the passage is in uh, passages in Luke are mentioned, and let's just cut the chase. That's the one, I believe. Not that it matters. Uh, okay. So I'm going to skip two and three. I'm apparently not, uh, the, the, the smart people agree with number three. So let me give you that one. Uh, Jesus had a vision while the 72 were ministering. The vision would relate to the victories of his disciples over the power of evil. In other words, they're saying Jesus, when he said that, when he said, I saw Lucifer fall, he was having a vision while the 72 were out ministering. But I see no other reference to that anywhere at all. Now, for some reason... But I do not know the commentaries I read on this go with number three. Apparently, I'm not educated or smart enough to agree with them, so I don't. I know the Bible says Satan fell from heaven, was cast down by God because of Satan's sin or pride. I also know the pre-incarnate Christ has always existed with God the Father in heaven, so obviously he was there when Satan got the boot. Also, being all-knowing, he doesn't really have to be there, so I go with number one. Does that make sense? I also know that, uh, which means nothing, like I said, it doesn't matter when he saw it, it matters that he did. Uh, what else matters is the fact that Satan was cast down from heaven, from heavenly places where he was defeated, to the world where he is, where he temporarily rules. Y'all realize that Satan temporarily rules this world, right? Uh huh. First Peter, three twenty two says Jesus is in heaven in the highest position that God gives. Angels rule and angels rules and powers have been placed beneath him, subject to him. To be subjugated means to be defeated. 
So if you're subject to someone, then you're subjugated. Subjugated means to be defeated. Ephesians 2, 6, and I love, I love Ephesians 2, 6. It says, we are seated, we are seated with Jesus in heavenly places. We are seated with Jesus in heavenly places. We're angels. Rulers and powers have uh, subjugated, were sub, uh, oh, have, I've got it, have been subjugated beneath him. First Peter 3.22, Ephesians 6.22 says, We don't fight the enemies of flesh and blood, but rulers and authorities and powers. So, where, here on earth, where Satan rules, is that a good place to fight? Uh, powers and principalities? Yes. It is? Is there a better place? We're seated with him in heavenly places where he's already subjugated these forces. These forces have, uh, Satan and, and his ilk have been defeated already. And we're seated there with them. Let's fight the battle there. How do you do that? Yes. Praying, reading, knowing the word, praying, speaking the word. If we do spiritual warfare in the spirit instead of the flesh, we fight an already defeated enemy. Put in terms of the physical world, good ground and bad ground. You know about good ground and bad ground. High ground is good ground. Bad ground is, is lower ground if, if two forces are fighting. You know, um, Gettysburg, some people call the turning of the Civil War because uh, General Lee had been uh, really kicking butt and taking names. And uh, he found himself with his army at one end of a field that sloped upward. And at the other end were rocks and trees and bushes. That's where the Union Army was. His generals advised him to retire and till he had better ground and fight another day. But he was so enraptured with himself and his army that he says, no, we're going to charge. He lost that battle. 53,000 people died one day. That's the difference between good ground and bad ground. We want to fight on the good ground. We want to fight on our knees and in the Word. One year we got to the border and they wouldn't let us through. We tried two or three border crossings and they wouldn't let us through. So finally, we got out in a Walmart parking lot. There was uh, 60, 70 of us. And we made a big circle and all held hands. And boy, did we draw a crowd. And we prayed, and we prayed that God would let us through. The next time we tried it, through, no problem. Fight the battle. Fight your battles on the, on the heavenly places. Snakes and scorpions. Oh, not, oh wait a minute. I got, it's time, isn't it? Well, my, my watch is running uh, a little slow. I've got three minutes. But uh, we'll save that for another time. I, I know I'm about to. I see Sam just about nodded off. Uh, uh, You know, I'm not used to doing this. I, I don't know what the people, if, if anybody's watching, thinks of this. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize for the unprofessionalism uh, to our, to our uh, uh, streaming folks. Pastor will be back next week, and he will take the microphone, I promise you. So let's pray and be dismissed. Father, thank you, Lord, for the word that's come. And uh, thank you, Lord, for 
uh, letting me be able to research and, and uh, find out stuff that uh, I should have known, but I didn't. And Lord, may this word that I've spoken here tonight even from an ordinary mouth of an ordinary person, find fertile ground somewhere and grow the church, grow the kingdom of God. We ask it in the mighty, precious, holy name of Jesus. Amen.